The Spanish-American War saw the end of the European hope for new American colonies. If the Monroe Doctrine and wars after the Civil War did not bring up the idea to the Europeans. The war, however, was short, only seeing six weeks of action. The war is often remembered for Teddy Roosevelt's role in the invasion of Cuba. But that was only a small part of a huge story. A large part of the fighting was on the water. Most of the land fighting was away from Cuba, and Teddy himself is not completely covered. So we will examine the sea in the Spanish-American War. Why were the Spanish outmatched? How did the U.S. Navy affect the Spanish-American War? The U.S. after the Civil War expanded heavily into naval fields for various reasons. One was simply that the American Navy after the Civil War was not only very battered, but also very old for the time. This was when new naval technology and ideas were growing fairly fast, causing America to adapt. Though these ideas could only be so effective, with the nation done with the war and having other pressing issues. Another cause was the new European colonies, established when the U.S. was distracted. France invaded Mexico, Spain invaded the Dominican Republic, and America had to restore these nations. Another aspect was the idea of a greater America beyond manifest destiny, such as Alaska. So, for either of these reasons, the Navy was updated, the U.S. Naval Institute was established, and four new iron ships were made. The Navy would stay stagnant, however, until Roosevelt came into view. Roosevelt modernized the U.S. Navy drastically. Roosevelt, although only the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, helped set up the Illinois and the main classes. The United States standards were risen, and the Roosevelt would take pride in the Navy during his presidency. Overall, the United States Navy was well equipped and modern. Meanwhile, the feared Spanish Navy was out of its time and even had ships from the Napoleonic era. The war's original cause was the Cuban Revolution in 1895. The Americans felt connected with the Cubans' fight, and many war hawks wanted to fight. Another cause was the U.S. investments in the region, seeing many sugar owners, who had $50 million in the region, wanting to keep their land land intact and profits stable. To bring down the uprising, Captain General Valero Welder Y. de Nicarlo, also known as the Butcher, became in charge of the island. He put people in concentration camps, and many did not make it out alive. The American support was growing, but the public was still not willing to go to war, especially McKinley. But many people still want America's influence in the region. After all, America had tried and failed to take Cuba many many times before. Roosevelt wanted to show off the Navy, and many investors wanted to keep the war away from their plantations. So the president reluctantly sent the USS Maine outside of Havana. The Spanish in 1897 tried to negotiate with removing the butcher and promising that Cuba was a democracy. The Americans knew Cuba was still revolting, but other matters were at hand. That was until the Maine exploded. The Maine was most likely exploded by itself, or a stray Spanish mine. Even a book read about it, published in 1953, it says that the reason is unknown. Immediately, yellow journalism exploded the story. Isidore Roosevelt urged war, and then went to form the Rough Riders. Soon the president was forced to declare war, only one of five times the U.S. has done so. The U.S. Navy's first major engagement was at sea at the Manila Bay. Led by Commodore Dewey, the U.S. fleet was scared but confident about their engagement. The U.S. Navy had been well trained and equipped, but stories of the feared Spanish Navy were nothing to laugh about. That was until the actual battle happened. The U.S. fleet had four protected cruisers, two gunboats, the USS Hugh McCulloch, and various ships bought from the British at Hong Kong. The Spanish had three gunboats, two protected cruisers, and a wooden steamer. The Spanish fleet was decimated, unable to stop the U.S. behemoth. Spain lost 167 men, while the U.S. had seven mild wounds. Meanwhile, in Spain, they quickly came to a realization. The want for Cuba, Guam, and Puerto Rico was limited. The Spanish wanted to keep the Philippines, so Spain decided the best course of action was to try to gain glory in order to have better terms and to keep a possible revolution in check. Spain sent four protected cruisers, led by Pascal Torro, 
to Cuba, Santiago Harbor. As for the U.S. Navy, it blocked certain ports and secured vital areas for Spain's lesser colonies, such as Guam and Puerto Rico. Two squadrons quickly headed to Santiago once the whereabouts were known about. They blockaded the harbor, and even with multiple Spanish attempts, the Spaniards failed to save it. A few weeks later, with the army fully surrounding the city, it surrendered, and Spain, with most of its colonies, sold for $10 million. So how exactly did the U.S. Navy affect the Spanish-American War? It's quite simple. It won it. The war on the ground could not go on without the protection of the U.S. Navy. Another aspect is the actual war on the ground. The U.S. Army was not in peak condition. 100,000 men joined the Army because of the war, but most could not finish their training before the war was over. It was a complete miracle that Roosevelt and the Rough Riders could get on Cuba. Most of the troops were there were not enthusiastic, like the soldiers waiting in lines to join because of yellow journalism. Most soldiers fighting had been in the army for years and had little motivation compared to the new recruit, not saying that they were not outraged. So the forces on Cuba and Puerto Rico were nothing special. The Spanish and American troops were about the same, and usually either the Cubans or the Navy was doing the hefty lifting. The barrages brought by the Navy into Cuba helped the forces drastically, and the successes at sea also helped. So without the modern Navy, at least in 1898, the U.S. would find itself in a very different situation.